Chapter Three of Savarine's Disappearance. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Andrea Mossman. The Gerard Street Mystery and Other Weird Tales by John Charles Dent. Savarine's Disappearance, Chapter Three. A Journey to Town. In the early spring of the year 1854. A letter reached Savarine from his former home in Hertfordshire, containing intelligence of the sudden death of his father. The old gentleman had been tolerably well off in this world's gear, but he had left a numerous family behind him, so that there was no great fortune in store for Reginald. The amount bequeathed to him, however, was four hundred pounds sterling clear of all deductions, a sum not to be despised, as it would go far toward enabling him to buy the farm on which he lived, and would thus give a material impetus to his fortunes. The executors lost no time in winding up and distributing the estate, and during the second week in July a letter arrived from their solicitors enclosing a draft on the Toronto agency of the Bank of British North America for the specified sum. Savarine made arrangements with the local bank at Millbank to collect the proceeds and thus save him from the expense of a journey to Toronto. Meanwhile, he concluded a bargain with Squire Harrigan for the purchase of the farm. The price agreed upon was $3,500, half of which was to be paid down upon the delivery of the deed, the balance being secured by mortgage. The cash would be forthcoming at the bank not later than the 18th of the month, and accordingly that was the date fixed upon for the completion of the transaction. Lawyer Miller was instructed to have the documents ready for execution at noon when the parties and their respective wives were to attend at his office in Millbrook. The morning of Monday the 17th was wet and gave promise of a rainy day. As there seemed to be no prospect of his being able to do any outside work on the farm, Savarine thought he might as well ride into town and ascertain if the money had arrived. He saddled his black mare and started for Millbrook, about ten in the forenoon. His two dogs showed a manifest desire to accompany him, but he did not think fit to gratify their desire and ordered them back. Before he had ridden far, the rain ceased, and the sun came out warm and bright, but he was in an idle mood, and didn't think it worth while to turn back. It seems probable, indeed, that he had merely wanted an excuse for an idle day in town, as there was no real necessity for such a journey. Upon reaching the front street, he stabled his mare at the Peacock Inn, which was his usual house of call when in Millbrook. He next presented himself at the bank, where he made inquiry about his draft. Yes, the funds were there all right. The clerk, supposing that he wanted to draw the amount there and then, counted the notes out for him and requested him to sign the receipt in the book kept for such purposes. Savarine then intimated that he had merely called to inquire about the matter and that he wished to leave the money until next day. The clerk, who was out of humor about some trifle or other, and who was, moreover, very busy that morning, spoke up sharply, remarking that he had had more bother about that draft than the transaction was worth. His irritable turn and language nettled Savarine, who accordingly took the notes, signed the receipt, and left the bank, declaring that that shop should be troubled by no further business of his. The clerk, as soon as he had time to think over the matter, perceived that he had been rude, and would have tendered an apology, but his customer had already shaken the dust of the bank off his feet and taken his departure, so that there was no present opportunity of accommodating the petty quarrel. As events subsequently turned out, it was destined never to be accommodated in this world, for the two never met again on this side of the grave. Instead of returning home immediately, as he ought to have done, Savarine hung about the tavern all day, drinking more than was good for his constitution, and regaling every boon companion he met with an account of the incivility to which he had been subjected at the hands of the bank clerk. Those to whom he told the story thought he attached more importance to the affair than it deserved, and they noticed that the scar on his cheek came out in its most lurid aspect. He dined at the Peacock, and afterwards indulged in sundry games of bagatelle and tenpins, but the stakes consisted merely of beer and cigars, and he did not get rid of more than a few shillings in the course of the afternoon. Between six and seven in the evening, his landlady regaled him with a cup of strong tea, after which he seemed none the worse for his afternoon's relaxations. A few minutes before dusk, he mounted his mare and started on his way homeward. The ominous clouds of the early morning had long since passed over. The sun had shone brightly throughout the afternoon, and had gone down amid a gorgeous blaze of splendor. The moon would not rise till nearly nine, but the evening was delightfully calm and clear, 
and the horseman's way home was as straight as an arrow over one of the best roads in the country. End of chapter 3 Recording by Andrea Mossman